Thank you, Katie. Hi, everybody. Welcome. And um, I'm so excited to be here with, with this panel with, with these people who have so, for me, important um, and perhaps different point of view about what is to be part of a community and to be a volunteer in this community and at some point become one of the leaders and the people responsible to take care of the other members of, of the community. So first of all, thank you CSCCE for organizing this kind of meeting uh, where I always learn so much. And thank you so much, Saran Shimeli Sanyar for, for saying yes to be here and be uh, willing to share with us uh, all what got, that you know. So my name is Shani, I live in Argentina. Uh, since this year, I become community manager of our open site. But before that, I was, and I'm still part of several others community, the Carpentries, Our Ladies, uh, Mayar, um, Latinar. So a lot of R's, letter R's in my life. <laughs> and there is how I meet Saranshit and Melissa. And, and it's kind to have friends and people that I admire here to, to listen to them and learn from there. So I will give the microphone to Saranshit so she introduced herself and then to Melissa. So they tell you about them. Uh, thanks, Yanni. First of all, I would like to thank Yanina for recommending me uh, as a panelist for this call and for to CSCCE for inviting me for this panel discussion. My name is Saranjit Kaur. I am a statistician by training and I'm based in India. Uh, I am the co like Yanni, Yanni I, I have been a part of several communities. R is one of the major community, especially our ladies is one of the major communities that uh, I have been a part of for a long time now. Uh, along with that R forwards. Uh, recently, I have also been a part of the Society of RSC. Uh, I started the RSC Asia Association as a project uh, with the Open Life Science Program. Um, and I'm a strong advocate of open source and open science uh, principles and practices. So yes, that is me. Thank you, Saranjit, and thank you, Yanni, and thanks everyone at CSCC for, uh, yes, for organizing the call. Um, I'm super happy to be here, and uh, so just quick introduction. I, my name is Melissa. I live in Brazil. I am Brazilian by nature, and I have been working for some time around the Python, Brazilian Python community and uh, scientific Python ecosystem. My background is in mathematics. I used to be an academic. I used to be a professor at the university here in Brazil, and I left uh, the university and academia entirely to work on open source. Um, and I, I have been working around, you know, communities and education and outreach for Python and the scientific Python ecosystem for some time. Um, and I, recently, we have taken a grant from the CZI, which is the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, to work on community building and contributor experience more specifically for the four core scientific Python projects, as we call them, NumPy, SciPy, Matplotlib, and Pandas. So no R at all. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I think across the same kinds of projects as they are scientific uh, in nature, they have a lot of overlap with academia as well, a lot of users in academia, a lot of people who contribute are also part of academia. And so we do have that kind of overlap with the work um, that other folks are doing. And yeah, I'm happy to talk about community and what brings us here. Okay, awesome. Um, well, we you you already tell about all these uh, communities you are part of. Um, I'm part of your path, and we have this uh, first question for both of you uh, about how 
uh, a volunteer contribution looks like in your community. So when we talk about volunteering, a lot of people in the in the share notes uh, share what they think that is volunteer. We have this uh, also this definition that Katie shared with us at the beginning. Say so, give my time, give my energy uh, for free. Um, other says, okay, it's give my time and my energy and my thought, um, but for an stipend. And when we think about that time and that energy and that knowledge, how looks like that in your community? Do you want to start, Melissa? And then we go with, with Saranji. Sure, yeah. I think we have a number of different personas that contribute to these projects. And I'm gonna be talking about the four projects, but really my experience has been on NumPy a lot, a little bit on SciPy and Matplotlib. And for Pandas, uh, there's someone else working on it. So I just wanted to highlight my two contributors and part of my team are also here on the call, Inessa Pawson and Noah Tamir are this awesome team that I work with of contributor experience leads for the four projects. So we split ourselves across these four projects. And I feel like there's a lot of, um, a lot of different personas that come into the project, either people uh, like young data scientists or students or people who are looking to improve either their coding skills uh, when they're specifically coming for code and they want to get code reviews from the people who work on these projects. Um, some people, they want to come for professional development, but that looks a little bit different. For example, they want to have the contribution stats on GitHub. They want to have uh, the note that says they have contributed to these four important projects. Um, other people come more for the community and they are looking for connection. They are looking to be part of a group and they are looking to maybe contribute as, you know, different um, kinds of contribution, not only code. And there are also the specific and strictly like utilitarian, I would say, contributions, which are people who come to solve their own issues, to scratch their own itches. Uh, maybe they are academics, they are scientists, they are researchers, they work on something, they're using these tools and they need to fix a problem, and make something better for their own uh, jobs. Uh, so it, it's, there's a lot of different people, a lot of different personas, and sometimes it's not easy to find a way to um, address all of those um, personas and to make it easy for everyone to contribute. So there's a lot of, um, you know, putting it in a balance and finding the right tone to interact with all of them. So. It is really interesting to get to understand the motivations for people joining, but we don't always have that opportunity. So that's something that we potentially need to work on, which is getting feedback and understanding why people join our communities. Strictly speaking, we have uh, GitHub and it's the main communication point that we have. Now, these projects, something that we're working on is having a secondary communication channel like Slack or Gitter, someplace that people can come and, and discuss other things, not necessarily related to purely technical issues, but it's still a work in progress. I think this is something that we're, we're still figuring out. Yeah, RSC Asia, uh... RSC stands for Research Software Engineering and Engineers. So RSC Asia is relatively new and uh, there are a number of ways that we are trying to uh, provide opportunities for people who want to volunteer for us. Uh, for example, we have started a working group and what the thought behind starting this working group is that we could give some meaningful uh, opportunities to people who would like to contribute to the RSC Asia Association. So we have started, we, we advertised for roles like national representatives from Asia, people who want to uh, present their, uh, their nation or where they live, and they, they want to uh, promote the work of RSC in their nation. So that is one way that uh, we uh, asked people to volunteer. 
again, uh, when we started this working group, uh, we were mindful of the amount of time that uh, an individual would be investing. So we are not, ex uh, we did not expect a hard and fast time commitment as we are completely volunteer run. We don't have any stipend or any monetary support to, uh, you know, to pay for their work or the time that people are generously devoting us. So we, we, we have been very mindful with how much time we are asking from them. Uh, so it is very limited. Like uh, we have asked them to devote like a couple of hours a month, but even open to, if even if it's lesser, if for some time they cannot uh, donate, uh, devote that much time, then also we are open to that. Um, besides that, these are some of the formal roles. Uh, besides that for the community, uh, as I said, we are relatively new, so we don't have uh, so many uh, people who can help to, uh, uh, you know, create community events. So what we try to do instead is to join the existing community events. So if there is a community event happening, say, for example, Hacktoberfest, which happened recently, uh, we try to give uh, like uh, join that event and uh, encourage our community to participate in that event. That way, uh, we are leveraging the existing uh, um, programs or events that are taking place. And uh, that that also brings some motivation for a person to join because it's like they join RS, uh, RSC Asia community event, and then they are also participating in another open source or open science initiative that is uh, happening in parallel. So that is uh, one idea that uh, we are going forward with until and unless we find a good footing and uh, enough hands to help us uh, organize bigger events or workshops for our community. Uh, okay, great. Uh, Melissa, you mentioned one concept that uh, I don't know if everybody here is aware of. You say we have several personas. Uh, which I love <laughs> because I, at least I, I made that uh, concept because of carpentries and teaching. Do you want to explain a little bit what is that and how can be really useful for our community? Yeah, I believe the concept of personas comes from design thinking or some um, uh, structured way of thinking of the people who are doesn't necessarily need to be about communities. I think a lot of uh, corporate settings use that also for clients and potential user base and things like that. But it's the idea of coming up with ideal or idealized people who represent somehow your, um, in this case, our contributor base. Uh, I'm also, that's where I learned about the persona concept and found it useful at the Carpentries when taking the instructor training uh, course. And I feel like it's really useful, which is coming up with these idealized groups of people. And it doesn't necessarily need to be one persona who represents it all because that's difficult, but maybe you have like a student who is just getting started with Python, maybe they need help with something and then they don't know how to reach out to the developers and say that they have a problem and how would they, and then you put yourself in that position and try to ask yourself, how would they reach out, what the communication channels they would look uh, at, um, how you would communicate with them and that kind of stuff. And maybe there are other personas like, uh, a very experienced professor and they are having trouble with this very specific technical uh, method or something that they are using from NumPy or SciPy and they want to improve on that. So it's kind of a way of imagining the people who are reaching out to you. And it's not necessarily meant to be limiting. You don't have to keep yourself to those specific personas, but it can be helpful when coming up with generalistic solutions. Perfect, thank you. There is some other information on the chat uh, and also on the on the shared doc. Um, well, bo both of you um, already mentioned a, an idea of the people that are contributor to, to your community. Uh, Saranshi, that you both immediately <laughs> bound that to why 
people uh, will contribute um, and about this knowing this motivation and that is the next question that we are going to talking about and we are going to do the attendees also uh, participate in this so if we are ready Katie uh, we are going to show to all of you a little survey so if you want to answer, and then we are going to take that to continue chatting with Saranjit and Melissa. I just shut up so you can think about the answer. But I'm still here. And as a reminder there, um more reflection prompts in the doc if you want to add some nuance to your yes no answer here yes exactly okay there, there is our results uh so the question was if, if you offer multiple multiple ways and different ways uh, for people to volunteer in your community uh, most of you answer yes, and, and other people answer no. And please, if you want to share uh, why you don't offer different ways, that would be really interesting to know. And if you answer yes, uh, if you want to give more details about this way uh, of uh, participation, will be also awesome because can give to all of us some ideas. So my, my question now for, for Saranshit and, and Melissa, and I will ask Saranshit that uh, she start, um, is um, where you have these different ways, uh, how people know about these different ways to, to participate. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, for RSC Asia, we have these, this working group, and at, at present, we have two kinds of roles. One is the national representative and one is the code of conduct team. Um, and uh, what we have done is, uh, if someone wants to be a representative for their country, they can, they can be in that role for a year. Uh, and then after a year, they can switch that role to say the code of conduct team, or if we come up with a new role, then they can join that team. Or, and we have also kept the option open if if they want to suggest a role that is going to benefit the organization or the association, then uh, they are also welcome to share that idea. Uh, we mostly use uh, Twitter. We have been using Twitter so far uh, for advertising. Uh, it is a bit controversial at this moment, but uh, that, that is where we started uh, and have found a, a quite a following over there <laughs> yes so yeah so uh, that is uh, one social media that we have been using uh, as i shared earlier uh, this association was started as a project uh, during the open life science program and um, uh, open life science is a mentorship based program and i was very uh, uh, i was very a uh, firm that I need a mentorship to start a community this time because I have uh, I have done community work earlier. I have led community in my local region earlier, and uh, I felt that it is essential to have a mentoring role, a, a sounding board with whom we can share uh, how uh, how we are developing, whether we are facing any issues. So uh, Open Life Science, that program really helped us. Uh, they provide us, provided us with a mentor and it was really helpful. So there, there, were, there were times where we really felt that um, we don't have an answer for this question. We don't know how to move forward from this uh, point of time, but having a mentor, having that sounding board really helped us. And uh, that is how we developed the base for that association. So, uh, so yes, so uh, this is what I have to share about uh, RSC Asia. Uh, it's, it, is, uh, it is based on the concept of open science. Um, uh, open science is really at the heart of this association and we try to uh, 
promote open science, advocate for it uh, throughout our advertisements or through whatever workshops or events that we conduct um, and try to motivate the community to adapt those practices whenever it is possible. Melissa, if you want yeah, to. Yeah, sorry, I was reading Lou's message. <laughs> um, curious about how you managed to support multiple opportunities to participate. Yes, I, I think that's a hard question. So in these four projects that I've been working on and other communities that I've been seeing, there's a lot of talk. So these are mostly software-based communities, meaning that people get together to work around one specific tool or library. And so there is a very hard focus on coding. Um, and we would like to expand that, and make people aware that there are multiple ways to participate in these communities. So of course, there's the code part, there's the immediate second uh, mode of contribution, which is documentation. And a lot of people are aware that we're actively also working on that. So um, I believe that's something that people know about, but there are other modes of participation that people don't necessarily know about or don't understand as as important as coding and documentation for these open source projects. So for example, now there is social media. If folks are talking about Twitter. So there needs to be someone who handles social media. There needs to be people organizing and recording meetings and meeting notes and that kind of stuff. Uh, there needs to be grant writing, and that's mostly where we get our funding from. Uh, marketing, website development. Um, recently, we have been experimenting with this other uh, opportunity, and I just want to give a shout out to Inessa, who's here in the call. And for NumPy, she has been organizing new contributor meetings as sometimes like in a webinar format recording the videos and then we ask people to provide captioning and uh, translations for the captions um, and this is something we didn't have before but we can do with the volunteer pool that we have um, all translations for the website that's some other mode of contribution that we're experimenting with and all of these should be as valuable as the code contributions and sometimes more because these are things that really reach out to people and make it easier for new users and new contributors to use the project and to feel safe and empowered and uh, welcome in these projects. However, they are not. And very seriously, they're, um, one of the issues that we see is, for example, a lot of these modes of contribution are not recorded on GitHub stats. Right, so you don't have green squares for contributing to, you know, not necessarily for uh, documentation translations or other kinds of contributions that don't get really recorded in commits. So there are a few projects trying to address that. So maybe you've heard of all contributors, uh, which is a bot that tries to capture that information. Uh, however, you know, there are lots of subtleties around that as well. Like how do you count that? How many commits is a contribution worth? How would you record that in, in GitHub? So I feel like we still have a lot of uh, lack of clarity around how to credit people. And I think that's one of the fund fundamental issues when we talk about contributor work because people want to be valued. They want to be part of a community because they want to feel like they matter and their work is recognized. And if we don't give that to them some, somehow, um, I feel like the people just don't wanna approach our community. So that's an open question and I would love to hear other people's thoughts on that as well. I, I don't have the answer. Lisa, thank you. Yeah, so, uh what feels valued this is one reason that we have limited the amount of infrastructure that we have built around rsc asia we just have a website and a twitter account um because it's a lot to handle without uh without someone dedicated to do that work and also it is difficult to find people who are going to do that for you uh for free or for as as a volunteer so 
that definitely increases the infrastructure maintenance load on if the community is managed by only a handful of people. Uh, and that is one reason that we are limited in a way uh, of for advertising whatever we are doing. Um, we could have started uh, using different social media platforms, but uh, then there comes a time point like we we right now we have a website and we definitely find it challenging to maintain the website along with working and uh, organizing events for the community. So until and unless um, I really don't have an answer of how to make that kind of work valued because marketing, promoting the work uh, or the events that are happening in a community are as essential as doing the, the, the event, organizing the event and uh, having those contributions on GitHub, GitLab, or any of those uh, uh, platforms. But uh, there is, uh, like, I really don't have an answer for how to um, provide an incentive to people who, are, who would be willing to help us in that, uh, on that front. I don't know if uh, any other community has figured that out because as a, as a volunteer organization, we have not uh, so far. Um, I, I will share, um, th there is a really nice conversation on, on the chat. Um, I will take uh, the comment of, um, let me search for the name, uh, Parmville, please uh, tell me. Then you tell me if I pronounce it okay. Um, I will share the um, Our Ladies Organized Guide. Uh, I see you there, Barbie. <laughs> uh, she she shared with us that she spring um, chapters uh, close uh, with more experienced organizers, with less experienced organizers. We do we try to do the same in Our Ladies. Uh, so it's kind of we call mentoring program actually. So when uh, chapters start in, in one city, we try to pair with people who has more experience to help them to maintain the chapter active. And and the other thing that I will share it is this um, contributing guide that we have at our open site was developed by the previous community manager, and it is an amazing uh, document that explain different ways that people can contribute. One of the things that happened with these documents that I share in my experience is that for some people in some part of the world or with some uh, condition of life, give them <laughs> to them an entire book to read for free volunteer is kind of asking too much. So we need to find plus have the book because it's useful because you systematize your knowledge we need to find other ways to help people and to to scaffolding how they can uh, participate in our community uh, and i think in i, I <laughs> thank you i i really glad and i actually want to melissa and saranjit and Sharad come because we all come from what we know as the global soul so even as for this part of the world to people work for free is a big ask sometimes so if we also want to diversify who can be part of this community we need to take these details into account okay really nice discussion uh, people I, I go into my my notes about about the questions and you, Melissa, uh, mentioned this idea of the value of the contribution. And for the people who don't come um, from the open source uh, software community, we have this tendency that coding is kind of the only one who values. Or you are a hacker with three monitors or it's kind of, well, how you contribute to me. And I really like what you say, Melissa, about the, the value of this contribution. And I, I think that she also say the same. Uh, if you want to add, I know that you already say you, I don't have an answer, um, but I would like to discuss a little more how we can do this other task as value as the traditional one in our communities. 
I think there's a couple of thoughts that I, I, you know, like I said, I don't have the answer. There's a few things uh, that we've come up together with the contributor experience team or, you know, just thinking about how these communities operate. And I think one of the big things is having leadership buy into these ideas and set up the tone for the contributions and the value that they have inside the community. So if we can have leadership making sure they pass this message that these contributions are important and they matter in the, the community and that people are recognized for their effort, I think this is very important. Um, but I think there are other things you talked about, Yanni. Uh, I think this is a very common theme in Latin America in general, which is the privilege of free time. Um, having the time to contribute is not a given for most people in the global south. Sometimes they are commuting for long times every day. Sometimes they have two jobs. Sometimes they are caring for the elderly, for children, you know, for family members. Uh, th there's many different kinds of situations that happen. And maybe they need both, like you mentioned, more scaffolding for their contributions which I admit takes a lot of time also. And so for a community organizer to be responsible for that is also heavy. Um, on the other side, we can and definitely should start um, having multiple levels of contribution. Maybe we can come up with smaller tasks that only take an hour or two that people can come, you know, approach and contribute to. If I have a pull request that I want to do for NumPy and I know it's going to take me 40 hours of my time, I may be less uh, you know, engaged and less willing to do that. But if I know it's a quick fix of an hour or two, and maybe this is part of a larger project that can in the end come up, um, I think this is useful. But for the most part, I feel like it's also a question of understanding the expectations that people have when they come to your project. And again, for the people in the Global South, it is important that they get something back from their contributions. Uh, either they can put this on their CV or they can list their contribution on GitHub or they can somehow say that they are a part of the community. This is really important for people, for them to get better jobs, for them to develop themselves professionally and guarantee that they have an income in the future. So I don't think and I think there is still a culture on open source that these are somehow selfish reasons for contributing and I can hear that a lot from maintainers as in like, oh, they're just coming here because they want to get a line on their CV that says they contributed to our project. This is perfectly fine and a legitimate reason for contributing. And we should be meeting these people where they are. So we, you know, there's space for everyone. <laughs> we can maybe uh, understand how to cater to different audiences and understand how to eat. You know, I think I absolutely agree with you. This is part of diversifying our contributor base, is understanding different ways, different reasons, different motivations for people to contribute. Uh, I feel one way to recognize the volunteers would be providing them with exposure uh, to different opportunities, or mostly because. Um, the community leaders usually have a good network globally, so they can expose the people who are volunteering for their community to the global network. Um, and also because now we have remote opportunities available, like I'm sitting very far away from most of the people on this call, but I'm still on this call. So this kind of exposure, uh, the, this kind of um, effort to provide an opportunity to someone uh, who would have normally not been on this space with most of the people at this time point. So this uh, this itself is a recognition. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a huge recognition for, for people who, like th there are several issues of why a person from the Global South cannot be a part of many uh, international tech events that happen in a specific geographical location most of the time. So uh, recognizing and exposing people is one way. Um, another way uh, I can think of is uh, nominating 
uh, people. So maybe we can have badges on GitHub for different kind of contributions. Um, uh, we can invite them on our organizations on GitHub. Um, uh, and uh, that is one way that I can think of for, for a person who has, for example, someone who has started to contribute to a community and they have really never used GitHub before. So it's a, it's a big thing for them. Um, it's a big boost. Um, personally, like uh, I started using GitHub because of Yanni. Uh, she invited me to do a task uh, for our ladies where I was I was just creating maps on GitHub and I was feeling so proud of myself that I have finally contributed something to GitHub. Um, so th these are like really small things when we are discussing very complex issues. These are some of the very basic and small things which which can be a turning point for many people. So uh, that 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 is one of my first contributions to GitHub. And uh, eventually I did Google Summer of Code and then I got to know about these several programs that are, that serve as entry point to open source, open science. And I, I have met so many amazing people through through that path. So uh, have uh, like doing those uh, gestures of kindness uh, and generosity towards people uh, can can definitely go a long way. Um, I don't have a, a very complex answer to this question, but I feel the the smaller things that we do for people um, can be can be really really beneficial for someone who would have never imagined to be a part of uh, such a big global community. Well, thank you, thank you both. One more time on the chat, there is a lot of interesting um, conversations. Uh, Cora tell us that they offer some stipend to people. Um, also, Rene said to us, uh, well, not always it is the stipend, but it's actually the access. And you both talk about that. And it is my personal experience too. Like if you are part and contribute to this community, suddenly you have access to a contact network or information firsthand. So you stop to get in late to, to the, the things and you start to be in places where you are part of the conversation. You start to have a voice. And that is also important. They also mentioned how difficult it is to send money or to get money in different parts of the world. Oh, yeah, <laughs> we know a lot about that. So, yes, that is complicated. So sometimes even that is not the best way. You can even produce more work for the volunteer than if you offer other kind of perk. And I think you both also talk about recognitions. Uh, about to how we can recognize this effort and and that is beneficial for the for the volunteer um yeah for example melissa yes yes and um, I, I mean i i can't explain how it's in Argentina. Uh, <laughs> so um yeah, Cora, it's also kind of hard. I will tell Cora say you can send the thank you gift of swag. Uh, I, I become a GitHub star this year. I my swag is on the aduana. How you say that in English? The 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 people who watch what get into customs. your customs. Customs, okay, and it's there. And I live 600 kilometers from where it is, and I'm not going to do a travel and all the paperwork to, to get that t-shirt, for example. So yeah, it is a lot of trade-off, but I'm so happy that we are talking about this. Uh, yeah, and we start being aware of this uh, different situation. Okay, I'm going back to my notes, and I'm watching also the share notes. Um, please ask. Uh, add any questions on the on the Google Doc. Um, and we already talked about what our volunteers can give from us. That is not only money, but sometimes STBEN is a way to allow people to save time to, to do this work. Um, and how how that was for you? For example, do, do you want to share with you about how this experience? We we um, uh, we also have this uh, talk about this other question about tell a real story about you as a volunteer 
that has a nice uh, positive outcome, another one that doesn't was so <laughs> positive <laughs> or beautiful like, like the other one. So if you want to take this question with uh, this, uh, how, how was for you and what you want for being in the community, uh, please. Uh, I see Saranshin thinking, Melissa also. So who wants to go first? I can, I can mention oh, very quickly. <laughs> Melissa, Melissa, no, I, please. Mine yeah, is yeah, very yeah. quick. It's uh, it's basically around the beginning of um, maybe the end of 2020. Um, you know, everything had stopped. Meetups, in-person meetups, everything had stopped because of the pandemic. And we had a local Pi Ladies group Um that I helped, I was working with at the beginning of the group, like several years ago, and then I dropped off. And then we said, well, maybe let's try and bring, bring those back up. Now everyone's meeting virtually. Maybe we can organize these meetings virtually. It's going to be easier because you don't have to find a location. And it flopped entirely because, you know, a lot of people were busy um, during the pandemic. It was also very um, stressful for everyone working from home, not being able to leave the house. And I think a lot of people were just like me at that moment, I was very tired of Zoom. I did not want another Zoom meeting. <laughs> and so I think um, we tried setting that up, but it never really worked. And then it was dormant for two years. And the good thing is that now in 2022, so we just had our first in-person Python Brazil again, um, and all met up in Manaus, which is here uh, in Brazil. And at that moment, it looks like everyone's spark was lit up again and everyone wants to participate once again and the group is getting back up and so on Saturday we're meeting for the first time in like four years um, and so we're all coming back and so I also do believe that there are these cycles and sometimes groups and communities go through these cycles of contribution and what is important in that case, for example, is that we had everything documented. We knew who had all the passwords, we knew who had all the uh, notes and what did you have to do if you pass the leadership on to someone else. As long as you have that redundancy and you have everything documented, if you need to step out, that becomes easier because then, you know, another person can come up and do it. They know what they have to do. They have the instructions. They have all the information that they need. So I'm a heavy advocate for documentation on that side because I, I just think it's really important to get, have that kind of redundancy so that people feel like they can step down if they need to. And other people can step up if they need to. They have all the information that they need to do that. Um, I started with uh, communities around 2018. So um, I started with participating in other another communities in my local region. And uh, it was only after some reflection that I thought of starting a Our Ladies chapter. So um, that was around 2019. And soon after, like we had launched our chapter, uh, it was an in-person event. We did one more in-person event. And soon after that, there was lockdown and things just uh, changed from there. So uh, it was a lot of uh, adaptation to the new uh, form of organizing and conducting events and interacting with people. Uh, but Our Ladies was my start uh, and uh, in 2019. And from there, I uh, uh, Slack is something that I got to know that there are several communities on Slack and there are people interacting over there whom we can reach out to um, and also learn about new opportunities. So after that, uh, I, uh, I participated in Google Summer of Code. Um, uh, I also participated in uh, the digital infrastructure incubator by Code for Science and Society, where I have been building the R development guide. So that, that is how it all started. Like I started with uh, one community and then uh, with time, I was almost a part of many communities. So uh, 
that is the positive part that you get a lot of exposure but but then there is also a part where you feel you start feeling overwhelmed with the amount of work that you're expected to do in your free time and uh, many times it is just not possible like uh, the pandemic complicated it a lot for many um, but even if it was not the pandemic even if we look at the amount of uh, work that a volunteer is expected to do when they are part of many communities it is not very easy uh, to stay motivated and to keep and to have that energy to keep going uh, if uh, if there is not much meaningful output from that uh, that kind that work so that is where uh, that is one part that i really find challenging and uh, now when i am leading an organization i try my best to limit the amount of work and time that is expected and the energy that is expected from volunteers. Uh, Rene is on the chat also uh, taking <clears throat> and talk, talking about this point of burnout. Um, I, I would like to, to also discuss this with you. Um, this is happening a lot in coding uh, communities in, in, in open source. And some of the things that uh, happen with, with people is like, if I don't still continue giving all this time, I will lose all the perks that I get and I will lose my prestige. I perhaps going to become irrelevant. That is things that I listen uh, in, in several conversations we have about this for now. So, and, and that is why this is also perhaps attached to this compensation about what we get uh, from this community. I think that most of us start because we enjoy what we do and because of the, the community we joined was important to us, was doing some work we value. And then we start to be part, then we start to enjoy the, the belonging, the, the group of people we work with, the, the perks to, to be part. Um, and at some point you can't do it more, and then you are afraid, perhaps. So what what do you think about this? And and again, I think that is related to how we create a space to people don't feel that, that they know they can stop or even leave for a moment and what is going on there. Saranshi, do you want to start and then we go with Melissa? Um, yes, uh, so uh, in most of the conversations, what I see is that uh, like most of the community, there is a lot of emphasis on the onboarding process. Um, but I feel that in addition to the onboarding for process, there should also be a equal, equal emphasis on the offboarding process and a smooth way to get out or a respectful, a respectful way of uh, leaving that community. So uh, it should not be something like that. Uh, once you join a community, it's a lifelong commitment that you're going you, that you need to continue with this community. And if you and if you step back for any reason that uh, people are not going to support you or you're going to lose those friendships. So that kind of feeling uh, should not be there. There should be a, a proper offboarding process by which people can respectfully step away and take their time and join only when, if and when they feel that they want to join back or, and if they don't want to, then also uh, it should not like, it should not be like burning any bridges or because, uh, from my experience, it can get hard, even to the best of us, um, volunteering our time and doing uh, community work can be really hard. So um, a respectful exit and offboarding process is uh, what I would really emphasize on having in any community. I agree, I love that idea and I will add that I think it's very useful. And I don't know that this is necessarily um, common, but we should see more of that from leadership. Uh, when they decide to, to leave the project, when they feel like it, they can't give it any more time or they need to do something else with their careers, maybe they're moving on, 
it would be very helpful to have a case study of leadership leaving and, you know, understanding that this is a natural process. It's a cycle that maybe has closed off for them, or maybe they want to come back later, but they don't need to do exactly the position that they're in right now. So I would love to see more examples of that happening um, and as setting an example for other contributors, really, um, I think there's one side of it. And the other, um, I like I said, I'm going to repeat that. I'm a very big fan of documentation in that case, leaving everything documented. This is what you have to do if people need to step up to this position that I'm leaving right now. This is what you need. This is the expectations that you have, you know, and, and that's how you can fill that position. I feel like, so there's been this, um, a long time ago, my husband was part of another tech community in Brazil that has nothing to do with what I do, <laughs> but uh, they had this meetup, like regular meetup that they would have, and the group would organize themselves in um, cycles. And so they had uh, like, let's say 10 people, and then five people for this meetup, they are on call and five people are not actively engaged. They are backup. And next time they would all declare themselves, you know, this time I'm going to be on call because I'm good to go. This time I can't be, so I'm going to be on backup. And then they would rotate these positions constantly. And so everyone was okay with saying, I can't participate right now. I'm busy. I have other stuff to do that would be totally fine because you knew there was someone else to pick up that job. Um, so having that clarity, understanding what you need to do, setting the expectations, I think it's great. Um, other than that, I completely agree with the offboarding process. And yes, please, let's have more of that. And I actually think it's really hard <laughs> on the other hand, but I would love to have more experiences from other communities on how they do it. I actually think we have a lot to learn from the nonprofit sector in general. And I don't know that we necessarily connect with these people on a regular basis. Um, I would love to learn more about how people do this in other areas of life, not just the tech or not just software, not just you know scientific open source. Um, I think a lot of people have been working on this for a long time and we should also connect and learn more from them. Yeah, thank you. I, I I think that the idea of the process also helps to uh, dilute a, a, a little the power imbalance um, because of some of the comment is like uh, the volunteer choose uh, to say, I, I'm not going to participate in this anymore. But sometimes when you don't have so much opportunities, the community is the only one you, you have, and you actually see that as your only choice. So it's like, if I stop contributing here, I lost a lot, but my life now don't allow me to participate. So we need also to keep this in mind when we think people have choices. Uh, you don't, always even if you have you don't always feel like that and and a process a clear process and expectation as Saranjit and Melissa say will help with that that you also the process ensure that you are not going to lose those benefits but, and that you can do this without guilt and easy uh, about that uh, living for this moment the, the community uh, so, okay, Rene also say that he has a persona like uh, Emeritus. <laughs> so <laughs> that's, that's cool. Um, Katie, uh, I think we are on the top of the hour. Um, if anyone has a question um, and it wants, wants to unmute, you are invited to do that. I was trying to read what was on the chat, but if I miss anything that you want to recover and say, please uh, feel free to do it. And now I'm, I'm reading the, the share doc to, to take some of your comments. Yeah, if, you, if anyone wants to ask a question of our panelists, you can just raise your hand um, and we will open the floor. 